Hello again, and welcome to another episode of Connected by Controversy. I'm your host, Chris White, and today with us again is Dr. Michael Beckley of Tufts University. Uh, for those of you who listened a couple months ago, Dr. Beckley talked to us about the uh, broader context of the Ukraine crisis that uh, the, the war had just begun. Uh, so now I guess we can call it the Ukraine war, and now we're about two months into it. And I wanted to invite Dr. Beckley back on the program to talk to us about how China fits into this broader um, kind of uh, conflict, but also just the geopolitics of what's going on in Ukraine and how that relates to China, especially because he has an upcoming book with his co-author, Hal Brands, which I mentioned last time called Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Beckley. It's great to be back, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I got a lot of uh, positive comments from our last uh, uh, interview, and uh, a lot of people really were interested in uh, what you had to say about the, the meaning behind the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how that related to broader world events. So I'm, I'm curious, how does China fit into this current conflict? Well, I think China's sort of caught between two different strategies. On the one hand, China wants to back its ally, Russia, because they share a common interest in beating back the international order that um, you know, the United States and its allies play a leading role in. On the other hand, you know, China benefits a lot more from that order than Russia does. I mean, Russia is naturally a disruptor. It, 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 when it disrupts the international system, oil prices go up. And that typically has benefited Russia. For China, it's a major commodities importer. It's a major export-driven economy. And so it has to worry about the total collapse of the system. And so I, th I think you're seeing these two competing interests playing out in China, where on the one hand, China behind the scenes is basically parroting Russian propaganda, how this is all the West's fault to kind of maintain that narrative about why this existing order is pernicious. On the other hand, uh, you know, Chinese banks have been going out of their way to not blatantly violate the sanctions against Russia. You've had the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs issue multiple statements basically trying to say, look, we're going to be an honest broker here and we want peace, et cetera. So you see these competing interests. And I think China is trying to walk a fine line between wanting to prop Russia up, but not in such an egregiously obvious way as to invite blowback on China. Um, um, and, and to undermine a broader order that it still depends on in various aspects for its own continued rise. And is uh, the U.S. China's number one trading partner? Uh, it depends on which type of goods, it's either the U.S. or the EU, depending on what you're, you're looking at. Um, but in, in many areas, reliance on the American market is overwhelming. And that's just because the American market is so big. It's, I think at this point, it's still bigger than the next five markets combined if you just go to the world bank's data bank and look at you know final consumption expenditure um you can you can see how just dominant the american consumer market remains today and so certainly china wants to reduce its dependence on that market but that's a long-term project and so blowing up the existing order right now is just um, not a great play from beijing's perspective and those kinds of details do matter. I mean, a lot. I know when I was growing up in school, um, then uh, facts would kind of overwhelm me. But I, I found that the teachers didn't really uh, explain why these facts matter. Things like uh, the U.S. market being larger than the next five that matters, even if we don't have anything politically in common with China. China can't ignore the fact that we buy more goods than any other country does, and they have to factor that in when they're thinking about how they deal with Russia. Absolutely. And, you know, I think they're also looking at long term demographic trends and that that dominance, I think, is only going to increase in the years ahead, because the U.S., if you take the top 20 economies in the world, only three of them are projected to have growing populations and especially growing working age populations, which, also, which basically means the consumers, you know, people, adults, um, not children and not senior citizens. And the United States is one of only three of those economies. And so its share of the, the global pie in terms of just buying stuff is probably going to increase for the foreseeable future. And is China's population uh, demographic trend, uh, does it look like it's going to go down sometime in the next few decades? Within the next decade, there's going to be a major collapse. So just in the next 10 to 12 years, China's population is going to lose roughly 70 million working age adults, consumers, taxpayers, while at the same time gaining about 120 million senior citizens. So that's like taking an entire France 
of workers and consumers and taxpayers and taking them out of your country. And then at the same time, adding an entire Japan of senior citizens. Um, so, and that's just between now and the early 2030s. And then after 2035, China basically falls off a demographic cliff where it's gonna lose you know, another 100 plus million uh, working age um, people and gain, I think at least another 65 million senior citizens. So, I mean, this is both a short, a, a near term as well as a long term problem. And, and this, this assumes that the data that we've been working with coming out of China on its population is accurate, but there's been kind of snippets of information coming out of China's Statistics Bureau suggesting that they actually massively overcounted both their population as well as the birth rate, and that especially in the wake of COVID, that birth rates have plummeted much more dramatically than we even knew. And so it could be even worse than that. There was a recent study that came out that suggests from Chinese researchers suggesting that China's population as a total may collapse in half sometime in by the 2060s. So just you know, in the next few decades, you could have this total demographic collapse. There's a major study in the Lancet that said that's gonna happen by 2100. So somewhere between 2060 and 2100, China's population will be half the size that it is now, but more importantly, it'll just be a much older and less productive society as well. And is the state um, under Xi Jinping right now, for example, are they factoring that into their growth potential in the future? Yeah, I mean, you can see it reflected in, in a whole different range of policies. So that the fact that they went to a, they moved up to a two child policy a few years ago, and then they quickly went to a three child policy after birth rates continued to plummet after the two child policy, they've made it much harder to get divorced. So I think it, the most recent statistics I've seen suggest only 30% of divorce cases are actually allowed to end in divorce. And so there's been women who have complained that that's forced them to stay with, with abusive husbands. Um, there, uh, it's also reflected just in some of the uh, regulatory crackdowns that we've seen in China. So the fact that they've been cracking down on video games, for example, I think the regime is very concerned that what working age population they do have, they don't want, especially the young men spending all their time playing video games, they need to actually work and be productive. So there's just a whole range of um, and, and also other policies designed to make um, childcare more affordable. So the crackdown on private tutoring is in part to try to make having a family more affordable so that therefore Chinese families will have more children. So you, you see this, this understanding and this uh, understandably concern um, about the demographic situation reflected in a whole range of policies from Beijing. And does that factor into this poss possible decline? Does that also factor into the Belt and Road Initiative at all? So, yeah, I think that the Belt and Road Initiative, to, I think, is largely driven by excess capacity in the domestic economy, or at least that's how a lot of these projects got started. The idea that, you know, if you're a major producer of cement or, you know, you build, you build roads, you lay down pipe, you hook up electrical grids, at a certain point, there are diminishing returns within China. You've set up, you know, all the basic infrastructure you can. So there's all these major companies, many of them state owned that needed to go abroad for new markets. And this is not unique to China. I mean, we've seen this throughout history. In fact, I think it explains part of the US surge of expansion and indeed imperialism in the 1890s and going into the 1900s, because once the, the Americans uh, trampled their way across the continental frontier, they had to start looking abroad for new markets and new resources. So I think Belt and Road was largely driven by that, but then Xi Jinping kind of put his own personal legitimacy by coining you know, the Belt and Road and creating this new initiative. And so there's a mix of sort of geopolitical objectives, you know, trying to reduce reliance on traditional Western dominated markets. There's the economic factor I just talked about. And then there's also just the personal prestige of Xi Jinping. I mean, this is like a major initiative showing China acting as a great power on the world stage. So that also has become sort of a interest that has been um, um, sort of synthesized with all those other interests with Belt and Road. Can you give our listeners a kind of a breakdown of what Belt and Road is? Yeah, so Belt and Road is at its core, China lending uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Some estimates suggest upwards of almost a trillion dollars abroad. And then foreign partners use that money to then employ a lot of Chinese firms to come out and build infrastructure. So they build everything from roads, they set up mines, they build soccer stadiums, they build ports. 
And some of these projects are economically viable and have paid dividends. So people point to, for example, a port in Greece, Piraeus, that has been profitable uh, since it was set up by the Chinese. But obviously, there's also a lot of white elephants here as well, you know, roads to uh, roads and bridges to nowhere. Um, and even according to China's own statistics, roughly half the money they've lent abroad is probably not going to be paid back. And a lot of these loans are going to come due in the next 10 years or so. And we know for a fact there's been at least more than $500 billion lent abroad. And some people think it's almost up to a trillion dollars. So it's this huge surge of sovereign lending to kind of grease the wheels to employ and create, generate demand for Chinese exports, for Chinese companies. Um, and it's, it's essentially an attempt to open up new markets to, to uh, Chinese goods. And uh, the, the comparison I've seen is something like the Marshall Plan, where it's much bigger than the Marshall Plan, but it also has to do with uh, kind of, uh, uh, I mean, in the case of the Marshall Plan, this is really probably more selfless, though, uh, in the case of the United States, they're really trying to rebuild Europe, but it also is to facilitate, it was to facilitate uh, uh, trade, which would also benefit the United States, too. Um, can you give kind of a comparison between those two? Yeah, I, th I think the the uh, the analogy is sort of inapt because I think there's two key differences. One, you know, Marshall Plan uh, aid was a lot of it was aid, you know, whereas this we're talking about sovereign lending with relatively high interest rates. I mean, this mm -hmm. money is technically supposed to be paid back. I mean, China is not going abroad trying to uh, just throw goodies around. The second is, you know, I, you know, from an American perspective, you want to say it was this benevolent act, but you know, really what it was was standing up strong anti-communist bastions to create a big alliance that could check Soviet expansion. So the interests were clearly geopolitical uh, in nature, whereas for China, there, there are geopolitical interests involved in Belt and Road. So if you look at some of the major investments, they're in ports and areas that you know China would ideally like to be able to control so that if there is some major international conflict, it can secure its major supply lines, make sure that you know, oil, natural gas, critical minerals are still able to find their way to China. So there is some investment in sort of the infrastructure of China's economic lifelines. But a lot of it is frankly just like greasing the wheels of commerce with massive sovereign lending. We will lend out a bunch of money. You're going to use that money to employ our companies, buy our stuff. And hopefully this creates a, a semblance of dependency. So it's essentially a, a economic empire of sorts that's being built. Whereas the Marshall Plan was like, we need to stand up these war ravaged countries so that they can we can march together as an alliance against the threat of global communism. I'm glad you put the word empire in there. That's what I was going to talk about next is because China um, kind of was on the decline as the other Western powers or Western powers in Japan were on the rise um, during this era of the of uh, the rise of imperialism as new imperialism, especially. But also this coincides with the uh, center of humiliation. Is that kind of uh, motivating China to behave in the way they are trying to carve out some type of imperial niche that uh, wherever it it, wherever there's room? I, I think it's so, it's hard to overstate how central the recovery from the century of humiliation is to China's grand strategy today. Uh, so, you know, the century of humiliation, you know, you can date it to 1839, the first opium war with Britain, really from 1839 until 1949, when the Chinese Communist Party, you know, boots out all the foreigners, especially the Japanese, and, and uh, wins the civil war in China. Uh, China's just ripped apart. And so this still informs what China is trying to do today. Like, we will never let that happen again. We're going to restore China to its rightful place mm -hmm. as a dominant, if not the dominant power in the world. If you look at Chinese documents, it's all about what they call becoming strong, becoming self-reliant, uh, making sure that we are never bullied. I mean, Xi Jinping in his one of his recent speeches last year said any country that thinks they can bully or try to control China or hold it down is going to have its heads bashed bloody against a great wall of steel forged by 1.4 billion people. So this idea of never again, you know, we don't trust you because we saw what you did to us when we were weak, we are going to become strong. And this is our right. This is our rightful place. We are a 5,000 plus year old civilization. And for a lot of that time, we were one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced civilization on the planet. And our, our goal as the Chinese Communist Party is to get us back to that point. And particularly for Xi Jinping, I mean, this is his idea of a, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, um, the Chinese dream. I mean, it's all informed by this idea that China was brutalized unjustifiably 
by imperialist jackals. And now scores are going to be settled and China is going to rise and become strong and never let that happen again. It's so core to what China is doing today. And of course, there's so much reality to that too, right? They just um, kind of had to constantly be fending off all these outsiders that were um, numerically weaker and who didn't have these ancient histories, deep histories like uh, like China did. And China had been, uh, you know, like Marco Polo and Columbus, all these uh, people were trying to seek out China. They wanted to learn from and benefit from it. And then they're on the decline as these other upstart nations are on the rise. Uh, and it seems like there's something similar to what to what Vladimir Putin's doing too right now, right? I mean, it seems like he's trying to restore uh, former glory, or at the very least, to protect them from imploding. Absolutely, I think that's one of the keys to understanding Russia and China today. That these are revanchist great powers. In other words, there are like literally lost Russian and Chinese territories, as they see it, that need to be taken back. That are part are rightfully part of their nation that are critical for their nation's long-term survival and ultimately their rise to greatness and that were unjustifiably ripped away from them various stabs in the back you know i mean we, we've seen this narrative play out in other countries but it's alive and well in both russia and china today so russia obviously you know when putin and that, i think in the west we've learned to take these things literally and seriously at this point that's one of the major effects of the ukraine crisis is now like when we look back on Putin's speeches where he talks about Ukraine not existing as a nation and just being basically a adjunct of Russia. And now we understand that he like literally meant that, right? That that, that is literally how he views the world and he's gonna act upon that. And so now we start to look at Xi Jinping's speeches where he says, you know, Taiwan uh, is, we cannot have the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation without bringing Taiwan back into the fold that this is a problem that cannot be passed down generation to generation. You compare that to what he's said about Hong Kong before they implemented that national security law about a year and a half ago that has basically crushed uh, Hong Kong's autonomy. It's, it informs what's going on in Xinjiang today where uh, there's this new emphasis on the ethnic purity of the Chinese nation and how these minority groups that used to have sort of some semblance of local autonomy now need to be brought back into the fold and 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 basically <laughs> subjected uh, as 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 um, just uh, supplicants of of a Chinese empire that's dominated by Han Chinese. So you you see this this emphasis on this long-standing sense of nationhood and these territories that they feel are are part of their natural sort of sphere of influence or actual nation. I'd add the South China Sea as well as another area that China has basically staked out its claim and said. This belongs to us, and it's only a matter of time before we try to take it back. So, uh, so talking about Taiwan in particular, I know that for um, you know people, American audiences who've been following uh, the uh, Chinese history since the uh, Chinese Revolution succeeded in 1949, um, have been wondering about what's going to happen to Taiwan. The U.S. has supported for so long, and then, of course, with Nixon's. Uh, uh, opening up to China, then um, then Taiwan's status uh, became a little bit different, especially at the United Nations. Can you talk about why it's so important? Why is Taiwan so important to China? Well, I think first and foremost, it's part of the the narrative that the CCP has crafted for its own legitimacy. So this, they say, look, in a century of humiliation, one of the reasons we we're able to be ripped apart so easily by foreign imperialists is that we were internally, we weren't unified and mobilized in a proper way, right? We were internally divided. Eventually, we, you know, China collapses into long periods of warlordism where the, the country's basically chopped up. And then you have the civil war between the nationalists and the communists. And so this idea that you have to, first of all, unify the nation. And the work has not been done because the nationalists were able to flee to the island of Formosa, to Taiwan, and set up a rival government that still sort of, you know, maybe they don't mean it so much, but they still claim to be the, the rightful government of all of China. And then the United States basically uh, has tacitly backed that in various ways and supported that. I mean, that cannot be allowed to stand. And the fact that Taiwan has then went on to become a democracy and a, and a relatively wealthy democracy that is now being celebrated around the world, not only does that mean you have this potential rival government, but it also threatens the legitimacy of the CCP because it shows an alternative way of Chinese governance, potentially a better way, a way that allows citizens to enjoy both a lot of wealth and technology as well as civil and political rights, whereas what the, the CCP has constantly been telling its people is, 
in order to grow the pie for everyone, we have to, you know, to make that omelet, we have to break some eggs. You know, we have to be able to push peasants off the land. You have to deny you organized political opposition. Taiwan shows that no, actually, Chinese civilization can benefit from democracy and can actually thrive under it. So first and foremost is just this idea of it, it doesn't fit the story that the CCP is trying to tell if this uh, democratic uh, government on Taiwan can continue to exist. I think second, there's just geostrategic factors. You know, you've probably heard it referred to as this unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, in the heart of East Asia. I mean, if you just look at a map, it's just so centrally located. And so for the Chinese, you know, in, in foreigners' hands, Taiwan is a potential launching pad for aggression against China. In China's hands, it's a launching pad as the next stepping stone. It's a logical place if you want to blockade or coerce Japan, because it, it's right next to all those Ryukyu Islands going up through Okinawa, all the way up to the Japanese mainland. You can put more pressure on the Philippines. It's just kind of a, a natural base of operations to control these critical sea lanes uh, passing between the East and South China seas. Um, so, you know, those there's these overarching reasons. And then I think it's also just become the center of gravity between the United States and China, that both sides have basically said, look, this is sort of the central front in our military competition with each other. And so that just naturally raises the profile and the importance of Taiwan um, even more. But I, I think overall, the most important factor though is just the ideology, the political factors and the legitimacy um, and the threat to the CCP's legitimacy that's posed by Taiwan. I guess if we could imagine um, kind of like a, a small state, maybe off the coast of the United States that had uh, a better system, a maybe better standard of living, um, and uh, they didn't have to go through all the turmoil of the Great Leap Forward and starvation and, and dictatorship in the same way, even though it was founded by Chiang Kai-shek initially, right? Um, they still got uh, on their feet, and uh, then that might be something that we could identify with. But it's just so hard as Americans over here to, for, to imagine what it must be like, just like with Ukraine too, we don't really understand why Vladimir Putin would consider uh, an invasion of a sovereign nation. Uh, we don't because we don't understand the geographical implications of having um, opponents or potential opponents on our borders. Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, it's easy to take security for granted. I mean, so much of our the fact that we're we're so secure that we basically uh, outsourced uh, border security for the most part to civilian agencies, you know, because we don't need to have the military defend the borders, you know, we yeah. have the oceans and the Coast Guard for that and Border Patrol. So our military can go to the other side of the world and, and muck around. For most countries, they do not have that luxury. I mean, the military is there to defend the borders and even to keep tabs on internal threats. I mean, the PLA, China's military, its prime directive, the most important thing is as a backstop for internal security. It's hard to imagine. The United States, that's that's illegal. Under Posse Comitatus, the U.S. military cannot be used to impose, um, you know, uh, uh, martial law in the United States to put down internal rebellions. But in China, that's like the prime directive of the PLA, because that's what the CCP fears most. And then the second directive is border defense. So a lot of the PLA is focused on border defense. And that just, it shows you uh, the the where China is located, the rough neighborhood it's in, and that obviously then affects the psyche of the leaders and puts them in a different headspace than what we are typical typically thinking of from an American perspective when we can we can take our territorial integrity relatively for granted. And it, so let's let's speak about that a little bit because uh, the uh, because China has traditionally been surrounded by neighbors, or at least um, we can talk recently to its neighbors that they have to worry about. Uh, in some cases, uh, in some cases, they've been to war with them as well. But does Belt and Road um, somehow lubricate that kind of, uh, are they, you know, trying to initiate like uh, uh, projects where they can uh, reduce the need to actually police their borders, like in places like in Central Asia, for example, in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the driving forces behind some of the Belt and Road projects and investment in Central Asia was exactly to try to stabilize those areas so that they don't become a hotbed of Islamic fundamentalism that can ultimately lead to cross border networks between the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, China's um, you know Muslim. Um, an area with a lot of Uyghur Muslims and uh, their sort of uh, either ethnic kin or religious affiliates in, in you know, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, et cetera. So you've seen a fair amount of investment in those countries and a lot of, frankly, security cooperation because those governments also share an interest in counterterrorism. And so you've seen a fair amount of that going on between Beijing and 
and those countries. You've also just frankly seen what we call sort of wall building, you know, basically just trying to prevent easy flows of traffic between those uh, those countries and, and China. So certainly, you know, if you look along the Belt and Road, you'll see the overall driving force, which I still think is economic, you know, looking for business for these companies, but you will also, depending on which area you're looking in, there's also specific either security interests or diplomatic interests. Like for example, some of China's investments in uh, Central America, a lot of that was basically to buy off those countries because they used to recognize Taiwan instead of Beijing. Uh -huh. And so Beijing came in, he's like, why is China pouring all this money into El Salvador, for example? Well, <laughs> it's not for traditional security reasons, but it's for the sort of more ethereal security reason of trying mm -hmm. to uh, isolate Taiwan diplomatically and get more recognition for Beijing. So you can look along the Belt and Road, there's all these different interests. And then the overarching push is this economic push to find business for Chinese companies. I see. And so uh, kind of speaking about uh, your book with Hal Brands coming out in August, what is it, what kinds of points of conflict are we looking at between the United States and China in the coming years? Yeah, so in, in, in the book, we, we argue that China's leaders may feel that time is not on their side. In other words, they have like a window of opportunity to achieve longstanding national aims and a potential opening window of vulnerability. Because for one thing, China's economy is slowing down. And in the book, we, we go into a lot of detail about why we think China's economic problems are actually much worse than most people think. Um, and second, that China is suffering from increasing strategic encirclement, that the United, especially the United States and its allies, but really countries around Asia as well, are starting to become more openly hostile towards China. Anti-China sentiment has skyrocketed in recent years to levels we haven't seen since the 1989 Tiananmen massacre, and it's manifesting itself in all kinds of ways that are making life more difficult for Beijing. Everything from the Taiwanese, you know, starting to develop this independent sense of identity, Japan, you know, ramping up its military spending, India, you know, with Chinese and Indian soldiers beating each other to death on their shared border, et cetera. Mm. Um, so there's all these strategic problems at the same time that you have a slowing economy. And so what we worry is, and we look back in history at every case where you've had a rising power that starts to slow down, what we call a peaking power, when, when great powers start to peak, that they start to become more risk acceptant. They start to make sort of smash, you know, they go for these short-term smash and grab operations to try to have near-term wins that will alter the long-term trends that don't look very good for them. And so we worry that China is going to move in a few areas. One, obviously, is Taiwan. We, we really worry that there's this kind of window of opportunity for China there in the Taiwan Strait because China has really ramped up its military power there and the United States and Taiwan have been a little bit slow. But by the 2030s, the United States and Taiwan have these ambitious plans to kind of restore the military balance there. And so if there ever was a time to move, it'd probably be in the 2020s on Taiwan. We also worry that China is going to double down on its pursuit of this sort of technological empire where it's basically trying to get lots of countries, especially in developing countries, sort of hooked on Chinese technology, the Chinese ecosystem of various technologies. They want to lay down all of their 5G networks. And at the same time, they want all these countries to be sending all of their data back to Beijing. And so China is creating this sort of new form of economic empire that could lock a lot of countries in. And then the third and related factor is the spread of this digital authoritarian model around the globe that China, in order to shore up its own authoritarian government at home is realizing that you can't let waves of like an Arab Spring or color revolutions topple dictatorships or God forbid what happened in Eastern Europe at the end of the Cold War where communist regimes started falling and dropping like flies. The Chinese want to forestall that. And one way they're doing it is by exporting all these digital authoritarian technologies that frankly make dictatorship so much more effective and affordable than ever before. And we really worry that could shift the balance between democracy and autocracy in the world. So it's really Taiwan, this sort of new form of economic mercantilism or imperialism, and then the, this, um, this push to, to promote and expand digital authoritarianism abroad. How has COVID affected this? I, I think it's accelerated all of these trends because on, on the pressure side, on the things that China is facing, I mean, you're seeing with the zero COVID policy, I mean, they're locking down their major cities and economic experts. There was a great article in Foreign Affairs by Daniel Rosen, where he says, you know, zero growth or even a contraction in China's economy is not out of the question for this year. And that's just compounded the long-term slowdown that we chart in our book. Um, and at the same time, because, you know, COVID, you know, the pandemic uh, starts in China, China uh, was, um, let shall we say, not the most cooperative 
actor, you know, basically preventing any kind of investigation. And then, you know, any country that had the audacity to call for an investigation like Australia was subjected to a full blown trade war by China. Um, and so that also explains this rise in anti China sentiment and therefore the strategic pushback that China is getting. So it's clearly exacerbated China's problems at the same time um, that it has basically caused the Chinese regime to double down on a lot of these authoritarian tendencies to say, look, things are getting out of control and our natural reaction is to just clamp down with our fists, right? So that means Hong Kong is gonna be squelched out. That means uh, zero COVID is going to be implemented and we're gonna lock down big parts of the Chinese population. That means that if there are military moves, we're no longer going to be willing to brook compromises or, or subject ourselves to potential setbacks or any slight. I think it also explains the wolf warrior diplomacy coming out of Beijing, this idea that, you know what, everyone hates us anyway, let's just stick it to them and just drive a hard bargain and show them that we are not going to be messed with. Um, I mean, and we've seen this in history. That's that's one of the key points we try to make in the book is that this is not an isolated incident. When powers start to peak, they tend to become much more prickly, nasty, expansionist. And we really worry that China in the 2020s could, could go through the same pattern. And so just to kind of wrap it up, do you all offer some uh, some solutions or at least some some ideas on how American uh, foreign policymakers should deal with this coming threat? Yeah, I think the overarching point we make is that instead of thinking about U.S. China competition as this like decades long marathon or a new Cold War, that you need to be thinking about it like like at least the sharpest phase is going to be a decade long sprint in the 2020s. And so that changes the kind of policies that you would emphasize right now. To compete with China. So instead of investing in long term R&D on like new weapon systems that may come online 10 or 20 years from now, uh, you need to basically just flood the area around the Taiwan Strait with as many shooters and sensors as you can. If that means you have to strap missile launchers onto barges and send them out there, or if you, you know, any way that you can get firepower, basically doing what we should have done with Ukraine, where you, you know we could have sold them many more weapons, so they would have been better prepared to hopefully deter a Russian invasion or to inflict major costs early. Now we're trying to like do it on the back end, you know, trying to get them weapons. But like, you want to get things out in front to restabilize the balance of power there. Uh, same thing with um, the economic situation. So we actually say, look, in the short term, you're not going to be able to change China's behavior. So like coercion or persuasion is probably out. What you need to do is protect the crown jewels of American technological superiority. So we, we actually come out in favor of things like short-term um, export controls, investment restrictions that will protect American industries from espionage and from, um, from sort of the mercantilist model that China is trying to implement. And same thing with the spread of digital authoritarianism. We basically advocate that the, the democracies around the world need to get together and help each other shore up their domestic political systems. They need to offer alternatives to developing countries so they don't become so reliant on Chinese technology that they basically have to submit to the broader model that it's trying to impose. All of these measures can basically be summed up by like, you have to MacGyver solutions as quickly as possible. You don't have time to kind of sit up and dream up perfect solutions. You have to kind of jury rig ways to shore up all these different local balances of power in the short term, because we really worry China is going to be moving in a very aggressive way uh, within the next five to 10 years. And uh, kind of last uh, question, do you uh, agree? I mean, John Mearsheimer says that this uh, situation with Russia and Ukraine is kind of uh, not nearly as important as with China. I mean, he used the term uh, China. He thinks China is going to eat our lunch um, in one of his talks. Do you think that the Ukraine situation is less important than what's going on in China? Is it diverting our attention away from what's more important? It's, it's tough. I don't think you can separate them okay. totally because for one thing, I mean, we can't, you know, this is the largest war in Europe. And while I agree that, like, for example, I think Taiwan is more strategically important for the United States for many reasons than Ukraine, but that doesn't mean the Ukraine crisis is unimportant because there is like an actual risk of escalation to major war between Russia and NATO here. And, you know, both sides have nuclear weapons. And so even though Ukraine itself may not be the critical piece of territory that you would want to put all your eggs and defend, this is a serious situation that requires attention. And as we talked about at the start of this podcast, there are, if, you, if all you care about is China, there are still links because clearly what Russia and China were trying to do with their, no, their so-called no limits alliance or no limits partnership was basically take off the table all the things that could potentially divide them so that they can fight with their backs up against each other against their respective 
enemies in the Western world on their respective flanks. So to basically shore up things uh, between them so that they can then concentrate and cause problems and ideally overstretch the United States across two different theaters. And so I don't think you can just allow Russia to run rampant in its near abroad without thinking that this is somehow not going to hurt you when you're trying to take on its ally, China, um, in East Asia. So even though I consider myself someone that leans towards more toward an Asia first kind of policy, I also recognize and have been reminded by Russia's aggression in Ukraine that the United States doesn't have the luxury of like just outsourcing security in one region to concentrate on another. You need to have the United States and its critical allies involved in each of these um, hotbeds in Europe, in, in the Middle East, as well as East Asia. I'm glad you clarified that and, and, uh, and compared it. And I should say, too, I should qualify my previous statement by saying that Mearsheimer made that comment before Russia uh, carried out the outright invasion. He was talking in the context of, uh, of the Donbass conflict. Uh, but uh, but in, in it seems like there's this long running tradition, too, especially going back to the Cold War, late 40s, where you have this division in U.S. foreign policy circles of the people who are looking at Europe first versus the people looking at Asia first. Right. Uh, it just uh, occurred to me. I mean, this is we're going on uh, almost eight decades of, of this kind of a, of a debate, but uh, but they're interlinked, as you as you point out. Yeah, I mean, I think the Cold War is a really interesting example, because at the start, obviously, a lot of people wanted to focus on you know, the Soviet Union and the balance of power in in Europe. Um, but then guess what happens? The Korean War breaks out in an area that prior to that war, the United States had announced that the Korean Peninsula was not within our security perimeter. In other words, like we don't consider that critical territory. We're going to focus on the island chain on Japan, the Philippines, et cetera. And so then, you know, North Korea basically takes that as a green light um, and invades South Korea. But the ironic thing is that even though the war starts in Asia, it has it redounds and has effects all across the board. And so the United States not only ramps up its containment barrier in East Asia, but also, I mean, this is NATO basically is jump started. You know, it was it existed on paper, but it really became a fully functional military alliance in the wake of the Korean War. Uh, NSC 68, you know, this critical strategic document for the US that basically called for a massive increase in defense spending and really focused on uh, trying to push back and beat back the frontiers of communism. That was, you know, collecting dust on a shelf. And then when the Korean War breaks out, there's this new impetus to basically create this global containment barrier. So I think, I mean, you could see something similar happen here where the United States, you know, is shocked by this war in Europe, even though the Biden administration wanted to focus on Asia. And while on the one hand, obviously the United States will focus on Europe, it now is going to actually increase its activities in East Asia as well. And I think it was instructive that even in the early days of the war, you know, Blinken, uh, Sullivan, you know, all these top administration officials were going to Asia to remind Asian allies that the United States still intended to be um, an Asian power, even at the same time that it was dealing with the immediate fire in, in Europe. So I think that's what we're seeing today. We'll see how far it goes. Wow. And I, I really appreciate you being on the program again for our listeners, because uh, you give us a lot to think about. And uh, really want to recommend people to read your first book, Unrivaled, and also the uh, upcoming book, uh, which is, is it slated to come out in August? Uh, yeah, I think August 15th or 16th, it's coming out. Great, great. I'll, I'll pre-order a copy. Thanks so much, Dr. Michael Beckley, for being with us again on Connected by Controversy, and uh, look forward to uh, hearing more what you all have to say. Thank you, Chris. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I appreciate it. You bet.